So good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. May I welcome you all and, and in particular welcome Minister uh, Dr. Helena Daly, uh, Minister for European Affairs and Equality of Malta. Uh, we're very pleased to have you Minister and, and you're most welcome. Um, just before we start, uh, a few of the house rules. Uh, may I ask uh, everybody to put their phones on silence, uh, silent mode, uh, so that uh, we can proceed uh, on an interrupted fashion. Uh, the Minister's address will be uh, on the record, and as usual, uh, the questions which she has kindly agreed to take afterwards will be uh, on the Chatham House rules, where we can identify the information, uh, but not the location of the speaker. Um, so uh, we're very pleased to have you, Minister, here because uh, we are uh, at opposite ends of the European Union. Uh, we are here on the western seaboard and you uh, are on the eastern and the southeastern uh, frontier of Europe. And in that sense, of course, uh, uh, you have uh, quite a number of challenges uh, that, that we are interested to hear about and that, of course, we also need to handle together. Uh, the Minister has a very distinguished background. Uh, she was appointed Minister for European Affairs and Equality of Malta in June 2017. But in fact she's one of the longest serving women in the Maltese Parliament, having been first elected in 1996 and I think in five subsequent elections, uh, which has to be uh, a very definite record and uh, uh, a hugely positive mandate. Uh, she holds a PhD in political sociology and lectures in economic and political sociology, public policy and uh, sociology of law at the University of Malta. Um, she, in 2013 and 2017, uh, I think it's of interest that as Minister for Social Dialogue, Consumer Affairs and Civil uh, Liberties, uh, under the direction, the, uh, her direction, the government introduced several laws and policies to strengthen equality. Um, and the minister uh, was the first Maltese nominee and winner of the European Diversity Award for her work in human rights and equality at the local and international level. So a hugely distinguished um, uh, curriculum vitae. Um, as I said, many of the issues facing uh, Maltese society as a frontier member of the European Union, such as irregular migration, maritime and energy security, and the need for social cohesion, obviously require European solutions. Um, we would obviously be interested, Minister, to hear uh, your view of uh, the renewed focus on migration and uh, how the EU can deal with these issues, but of course any of the other challenges uh, that we, with you, face in Europe as we go forward. So, Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, and good afternoon. And thank you for coming here, and thank you for inviting me. I'm very pleased to be here today at the Institute for International and European Affairs to talk about the future of the EU and uh, I really thank you for inviting me and I must tell you how much I enjoy being in your beautiful country uh, where I feel very much at home as you make visitors feel very welcome. So this is something which I have, I had discovered many years ago when I first came here uh, on a family holiday and um, the people's attitude to visitors hasn't changed. So thank you for being so welcoming. And I say this is not a platitude because I honestly enjoy being here. And I hope I won't change my mind after this session. <laughs> <laughs> Malta and Ireland share many commonalities, not only because as your prime minister had stated, and I quote here, geographically, we are at the periphery of Europe but I don't see Ireland in that way. The way I see us is as an island in the center of the world. This is what the Prime Minister of Ireland said. So I don't know how what I'm going to say is possible, that is regarding how many centers of the world they can be. But guess what? Us Maltese feel exactly the same. <laughs> Did I hear the word Lilliput here? 
<laughs> no, seriously, our prime minister too insists that we should strive to be the best in the world. So the center of the world as well. Mm -hmm. So we have to decide now who is the center. But, mm -hmm. yes. but apart mm -hmm. from both being the center of the world, we do have a lot in common. Our island status, the official use of the English language, progressive legislation such as that in the area of equality, also religious culture, and especially that of the Catholic Church, whether we like it or not, and also like with you, the influence of the latter and how it is being put into question. Archbishop of Dublin, Reverend Martin, last year said, the cultural influence of the church in Irish society is difficult to define. The Ireland, which many looked on as a bastion of Catholic influence, was the same one which, in 2015, approved marriage equality by an overwhelming popular vote. And this couldn't be closer to home. Catholic Malta, for three consecutive years, holds the first place in the European Rainbow Index compiled by ILGA Europe with regard to LGBTIQ rights. So it's the same dynamic here, which, which the Archbishop was pointing out, and it is happening in, in Malta as well. An anthropological study on the cultural differences between EU member states divides us between those who prefer a siesta in the afternoon from those with a Protestant work ethic. <laughs> I'm saying this because understanding and appreciating anthropological, sociological and cultural diversity is of the essence and can be a useful tool for conflict resolution and the strengthening of unity. We are all speaking about the unity of, of the EU, and unless we understand these anthropological, sociological, and uh, cultural diversities, uh, it will not be easy to have unity. Yet more pertinently, to talk about the future of the EU, we cannot ignore the present or the road that we have so far traveled. Today, <coughs> According to a recent Eurobarometer survey, Irish citizens are those most supportive of the EU, and the Maltese citizens are those who feel that membership has benefited them most. In fact, our membership of the EU since 2004 and the socio-economic policies introduced by the current administration since 2013 have translated into improving social and economic <coughs> well-being. Malta now has unprecedented low levels of unemployment and high levels of economic growth coupled with progressive social policies. This is the blueprint we envisage for the EU's future and which we seek to achieve and contribute to. The EU's success inevitably has its fits and starts. The EU of 27 post-Brexit will be a relatively new state of affairs and though we are optimistic about the transition, we could have done without it. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, the silver lining is that we now have proof of what can happen if citizens feel that they are not being listened to. Many feel that they are disconnected from the political class and the institutions. We need to empower people and shape our relations within the European Union according to their preferred outcomes. The process must necessarily be inclusive, thorough and decisive. Citizens at the heart of the EU were in fact a priority of the Maltese presidency of the Council last year and it is still the essence of our vision. In my address today I shall outline the three cardinal tenets of Malta's perspective on the future of the EU. We believe that to ensure the joint success of our nations within the bloc we need a European Union that respects, that invests and that protects. A European Union that respects citizens' dignity, their voice and inclusion through dialogue, but also that respects member states' competences. A European Union that invests in a targeted, sensible and coherent manner in order to address imbalances and enhance prosperity, that believes in and prioritizes its youth policies. 
a European Union that protects its citizens and their security, mainly dealing with the burdens of irregular migration while showing solidarity. With respect to respect, politicians have always achieved their greatest successes when showing profound respect for their constituents. The EU is a political project and must thus respond to such ethos. Citizens are calling for such a response. The following are some ideas where the EU can and should do better in this regard. Following successive enlargements, and especially that of 2004 when Malta became a member, citizens are faced with an increasingly diverse EU. Furthermore, a different EU to that which perhaps the citizens had in mind. A European Union that respects is built upon social rights. The Charter of Fundamental Rights and the Pillar of Social Rights Framework is an excellent basis for this across member states. Yet these rights are also best guaranteed in collaboration with member states and their citizens. They are best set in motion through dialogue and the respect for national and citizen competences. You will recall what happened when the constitutional with the Constitutional Treaty, even though the European Convention that drafted it in 2002 was more representative than the customary intergovernmental conference, it still did not pass the threshold of popular support. Mm -hmm. Taking cue from such events, citizens' dialogue is now becoming a centerpiece of EU relations. Furthermore, subsidiarity is fundamental for decisions to be taken as close as possible to the <coughs> citizen and in line with national competences. In Malta, we aim to lead by example. We are strongly committed to promote equality and foster a society which embraces everyone. United in diversity, a motto of the European Union, is not just about different cultures, but also about differences within the same cultures. Gender, sexual orientation, disability, minorities, all different yet all equal. We seek to tackle current challenges such as social exclusion, marginalization and the emergence of radicalism and build active societies which foster inclusion and diversity. Why is dialogue with citizens so important? Walking a few paces in the shoes of the other and empathizing can be of immense help to policymakers. For instance, as a result of consultation exercises, Malta introduced marriage equality, including equality and the right to parenting. In the same year, Malta introduced the neutral X gender marker for official documents, made reparative therapy a crime, introduced rights to transgender and intersex citizens, these initiatives complemented other ones which were introduced in our previous legislature, including the Gender Identity, Gender Expression and Sex Characteristics Act, as well as changes to the Constitution, eliminating any form of discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. We advanced because we listened and learned, yet more can certainly be done at both national and EU level to foster an equal society. The Maltese government welcomes the different EU initiatives for a more fair and social Europe, yet some of these are best served by national governments who are most in tune with their citizens at national, regional and local level. Subsidiarity is necessary and needs more vocal support if we are to have the concerns of our citizens properly addressed at the EU level. In terms of dialogue with citizens, Malta has a very strong ongoing dialogue on EU matters and is among the member states which favour broad discussions on the future of Europe in accordance with national workings. Malta has a shared commitment to European values and principles and to the vision of a strong, stable and united Europe, underpinned by our historical, cultural and geographic ties, as well as our mutual political security and economic challenges and interests. Along such lines, our Prime Minister has emphasised the need to listen to people with different ideas, including those who disagree with some aspects of the EU and those who feel excluded. It's important to listen to everyone and know their expectations. The Malta EU Steering Action Committee, a public agency, is entrusted 
with stakeholder and civil society dialogue and scrutinizes proposals in addition to the national parliament. Treatment to our success in terms of citizen involvement is the testament, sorry, to our success in terms of citizen involvement is the consistently high voter turnout for European Parliament elections, which at 74% in 2014 was the highest where voting is not compulsory. Mm -hmm. We look forward to continue to involve our citizens and engage with them along these lines. A final point on respect is that for competences. Division of competences goes hand in hand with subsidiarity and is important for citizens. The EU is a structure that facilitates permanent negotiation between the member states and while its centralized elements can be beneficial, there should not be central overreach. The EU is not a separate entity, entity but the sum of its parts which together lead to a greater whole. Our insistence on division of competences is grounded in our belief in representativeness and subsidiarity. It is also an EU principle that decisions should be taken as closely as possible to the citizen. This feeds the legitimacy of our action and enhances appreciation of the European Union. A European Union that invests. For Malta, the principle is for the EU to both allow investment and contribute to it. The investment should be in the member states' ability to operate and allocate resources in terms of national priorities, while aiming EU contributions towards fostering cohesion. National taxation prerogatives are key for us. Centralization and common taxes supplanting national taxation would immediately undermine the support of the smaller member states for the EU system. It is also much more effective for small member states to address their citizens through targeted investment stemming from the resources they are capable of generating. We believe strongly in the diversification of economic growth and as a small country with few natural resources, it is only through our hard work that we can survive and thrive. Generating competitiveness means being efficient and open for business. We will appreciate that you will appreciate that countries like Malta within the European Union have a particular soci socio-geographic context. Furthermore, as an archipelago, its smaller inhabited islands have needs unto themselves. Like Ireland, we believe that the MFF should continue to adapt to the EU's evolving priorities, such as migration. But at the same time, we should not lose sight of the value and contribution of traditional policies, such as cohesion policy and rural development. In terms of cohesion, this is crucial for a European Union of equals. This is where the EU should invest best, to address imbalances, some of which are caused by permanent characteristics contingent to member states. A level playing field across member states and equality within would go some way to enhancing citizen approval for the EU project and allow for greater unity. In the discussions on the MFF, which will define the first post-Brexit budget, we seek an outcome which is fair for all member states and keeps periphery of the Union well in mind. Our economies are in transition due to our specific characteristics Although we are no longer amongst the less economically developed member states, we have a continuous challenge to sustain conversion and the progress achieved in the past years. Furthermore, a European Union that invests prioritizes sound youth policies. The development of skills and education is necessary both for the present and for the future. In this regard, we welcome the Commission's proposal to more than double programmes for young people, such as Erasmus+, Plus, with €30 billion, Euros, and the European Solidarity Corps, with €1.3 billion. A European Union that protects. Citizens look to national governments and the international organisations they form part of to address challenges such as irregular migration. We are duty-bound to protect citizens and legitimate asylum seekers alike from the scourge of human trafficking. Recent incidents in the Mediterranean are sadly not the first and unlikely to be the last. 
The humanitarian aspect is vital, as is that of legality. Malta's stance has always been that to address the issue, which affects the EU as a whole, but especially the frontier states, there needs to be a European solution based on fairness and solidarity. Malta, in fact, has one of the highest recognition rates for asylum in the EU. Our calls for burden, burden sharing are due to the nature of being a frontier state, and we seek the completion of a, genu a genuine common European asylum system. We welcome the fact that the recent European Council specifically underlined the need for all vessels to respect applicable laws and not obstruct operations of the Libyan Coast Guard, in which the EU has invested considerable efforts and resources in training. Malta considers it important to ensure that implementation is taken forward on all aspects, external dimension, borders and internal dimension, in parallel, focusing exclusively on the external dimension and border control will not be sufficient. We look forward to the planned way ahead as regards the concept of regional disembarkation platforms, the strengthening of Frontex mandate and the reform of the common European asylum system. It would be naive, however, to think that efforts on the external dimension and border control can put a total stop to migration, so a system of responsibility sharing remains necessary. The Dublin regulation must thus be reformed. Moreover, we must protect the Schengen area. More than any of the EU's achievements, the, Ch the Schengen area of borderless free movement has gained the support of most citizens. It is a tangible and cogent benefit which they <coughs> value. While there are provisions for restrict restrictions to movement within Schengen, these are intended to be tempora temporary, limited, and of an exceptional nature. Prioritizing success stories such as Schengen also brings to light such a positive contribution of the EU project. The future of the EU has many hurdles in its path, starting from Brexit. Yet there is reason to be optimistic. The EU27 have showed that we can unite around our common interests. Support for the EU from citizens is at its highest in 35 years. Indeed, improved dialogue with citizens can certainly help this upward trend and allow us to forge ahead with a European Union, union molded by citizens. For this to occur, the EU needs to respect its citizens and ensure that nobody is left behind listen to citizens and include them in rulemaking processes. The EU also needs to invest in citizens and give them the economic tools to shape a good and better future. As can be judged by Malta's progress in recent years, economic well-being is key for citizens to feel valued. Prosperity with a purpose helps us strike a balance between the economic and the social. We cannot have one without the other. We also need to continue investing in the aspirations of our youth. We need to see and believe that their future is now. A European Union that protects is also necessary, protecting its member states from being alone and facing external burdens, such as regular migration and coordinating responses within a European Union that upholds solidarity. A social progressive Europe is our vision for the present and for the future. In meeting such aspirations, we will meet our joint success. I hope this has contributed uh, to your, the IIEA's quest for further identifying European policy trends, which will inform the work of Ireland's decision makers and business leaders. So as you can hear, I have read your mission statement. Thank you.